Ahora sí, ahora sí, buen día, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos los compañeros. Okay, now yes, we can begin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the comrades who are connected all across the world in this global forum of eco-socialist politics organized by the International Socialist League. Very grateful and happy to be here. Hope it'll be a panel to learn from and to sow a perspective forward for our struggles that we are carrying out in defense of our water, our land, our planet. This panel in particular is dedicated to the summits that are, have been taking place for 27 years around the world, but to debate in particular Latin American progressives and the extractivist model, which implies the place that this is going to take place in Belém, in Brazil, in two years. Where there will be an attempt to greenwash capitalism once again. And these progressive currents are some of the ones we most often debate with. So I'll tell you, in this panel, we We'll have Mauricio Mates of Revolución Socialista of Brazil, and also with Joaquín Araneda of Movimiento Anticapitalista in Chile, and myself, who is part of the Eco-Socialist Network in Argentina. We, at some point, are going to make a video for one, one more time for comrades who have joined. Know that at the bottom you have the world icon with the interpretation option to be able to listen to the simultaneous interpretation in English, Spanish, or Portuguese. So our idea is to discuss what the COP means. So COP28, these have been taking place for 28 years and they have been a complete failure. The main corporations and government leaders around the world meet to resolve absolutely nothing. Because since 1995, the first COP, which was led by Angela Merkel, who is no environmentalist. She presided the first COP in the world in Berlin. From that moment to now, greenhouse effect gases have multiplied like never before. So the COP, far from resolving any of humanity's problems, has turned its back to these problems and sustain the oil dependent model. One in 1997, there was the Kyoto Accords, which are raised as the great COP that uh, created this great agreement. It's and the other important moment was Paris in 2005 where all these countries had reached the agreement that given the imminent crisis, there would be a, a, a commitment from all the countries to not allow an increase of 1.5 degrees in world temperature levels, because that would be irreversible. Well, after 28 cups, we are definitely going to surpass that 
1.5 degree increase in world temperature. We're talking about this system of production and consumption of the current system. It's important to debate that after 28 years of Brandeis debates and speeches, they haven't even agreed not to abandon the oil dependent, but they haven't they haven't even been able to uh, agree to decrease at all the greenhouse gas effect. And that is if we're not already at the verge of catastrophe with the melting of the ice caps with the disaster in the Amazon, which is the main lung of the planet and the extreme climate events like the heat waves the floods far from being catastrophic we want to be sincere and clear about what is happening and be clear that if this isn't reversed urgently and we don't move to a different model of production by 2050 in the next decades not next century but by the middle of this century half of humanity will have will be in famine and massive migration crisis will which these already exist but half of humanity by 2050 will be exposed to desertification and other extreme crisis it, climate crisis that will push people out and will not have access to essential things like drinking water and food so in this context, it's important to discuss what summit we are facing. And what legitimacy is being given to these institutions. And last year, COP was organized in Egypt under a dictatorship with and one of the sponsors of the COP was Coca-Cola. So the climate summit was sponsored by the world's largest plastic contamination company, which produces billions of tons of plastics and pushes forward oil dependency so big capital the bourgeoisie those who make the decisions in the world's states continue to turn a blind eye to the climate catastrophe we are facing so discussing a way forward for the struggle against this is key so without further ado i want to present if uh, comrade Mauricio Matos from Brazil, if you could turn on your camera, can you hear me? Está el video. Está el video. Acaba de llegar el equipo técnico. Me dice que apareció el video. Si lo podemos pasar antes de que intervenga Mauricio. Vamos. Clinton, do you think the United States has spent since 1945 on the Cold War? Sometimes I ask this question and 
from the back of the audience comes an answer, billions and billions. <laughs> a huge underestimate. Billions and billions. The amount of money the United States has spent on the Cold War since 1945 is approximately $10 trillion. Trillion. That's the big one with the teeth. What could you buy for $10 trillion? The answer is, you could buy everything in the United States except the land. Everything. Every truck, bus, car, boat, plane, pencil, baby, diaper. Everything in the United States except the land. That's what we spent on the Cold War. So now let me ask, how certain was it? that the Russians were going to invade. Was it a hundred certain? Guess not, since they never invaded. What if it was only 10% certain? What would advocates of big military buildup have said? They would have said, we must be prudent. It's not enough to count on only the most likely circumstance, if the worst happens, and it's really extremely dangerous for us, we have to prepare for that. Remote contingencies, if they're serious enough, have to be prepared for. It's classic military thinking. You prepare for the worst case. And so now I ask, my friends who were comfortable with that argument, including the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, why doesn't that same argument apply to global warming? You don't think it's 100% likely? Fine, you're entitled to think that. If it's only a small probability of it happening, since the consequences are so serious, don't you have to make some serious investment to prevent it? or mitigate it? I think there's a double standard of argument working, and I don't think we should permit it. Now, let me indicate, what is it you would do if you took greenhouse warming seriously? And what I'm going to try to argue is that virtually every one of the things that you would do to ameliorate greenhouse warming make sense on completely separate grounds. They are worth doing apart from greenhouse warming. Unlike the defense buildup, which made no sense whatever, except if you were confident that there was a real danger of Soviet troops pouring across the Elbe. There was no other mitigating circumstances. The least efficient way to spend money if you want to pump the national economy uh, it drew all sorts of uh, scientific as well as fiscal resources out of the civilian economy. It is largely responsible for the economic chaos of the United States. Whereas, I will argue, spending money on mitigating greenhouse warming makes an enormous amount of sense for other reasons. Espectacular. We wanted to show this video because it's from 1990, which is greatly valid in 2023 still. More so with the approaching climate that will take place with that warming no longer being any secret, but a harsh reality and that these people knew what was coming <laughs> that we we're experiencing an actual war for now limited to the ukraine but in a crisis that is worldwide that's important this video highlights the logic of this system So in this context, now I want to present comrade Mauricio Matos, 
of Socialist Revolution of Brazil. I'll turn on your camera and you have the floor. Olá. Bom, boa aqui para quem está na nossa região. Hello. Okay, so for those of you in our region, good afternoon. I speak from Belém do Pará. Those who don't know, it's a city. In the north of Brazil. Vai ser realizada aqui essa conversa. A gente caracterizar como é o que é. Theory, the COP30 will take place here. A COP30. Nacional daqui daqui do estado do Pará. They bet on the government elected last year continuing. COP30 here in the state of Pará que era um dos seus começos estudantil no período anterior à ditadura militar. Então, com o golpe de, de 64 aqui no Brasil, o golpe militar, ele é... Com o golpe de 1964 no Brasil. E com o final da ditadura, com o processo que a gente chama aqui de redemocratização do governo do Brasil, essa família... After the return of democracy... In Brazil, Mauricio, se congela y avanza la pantalla. ¿Crees que paguemos la tasa? Do you want to try turning off your camera to see if we have better connection with you? Sí. Probemos si sin cámara sale más fluido el audio, no se congela. Let's try without the camera to see if the audio is clear. Okay, let's see if it improves. Currently the governor. And big local businessmen fazem parte de um partido que e o PT, PCdoB, os partidos da que a gente chama da da, da esquerda progressista. And the... unificar em torno dessa candidatura. Hoje quem vai estar? Brazilian Communist Party and the progressives joined behind this government participação existe e em Belém atualmente o prefeito é o Edmilson Rodrigues do PSOL currently the governor is of the PSOL the mayor is of the PSOL He is part of the majority leadership of the PSOL. The part of the Latin American progressive blocs that supports the COP. Tem uma outra característica que foi no 2022, então alguns dados ainda Belém não foram. has another characteristic. That's the latest data we have. Como, dentre as capitais brasileiras, a que tem o pior índice de arborização Place nas vias públicas. Belém. as the worst Brazilian capital in terms of 
deforestation in how much green space it has. Do, do progresso estão apoiando a realização da COP30 aqui no Brasil, né? na perspectiva de transformarem em um evento que vai. These progressives are supporting the organization of the COP in Brazil and aim to turn it into an event that will bring some kind of benefit. The debate that is being installed is not about the role of the COP. But on the amount of investment that will come into the city because of the COP being held there. They want to raise a facade in the center of the city that will serve as a facade for themselves. It is the first characteristic of the COP that will be held here in Brazil. Se dizem preocupados com tradições, como foi tocada anteriormente uh, pela GS. O, the sectors a... of the progressive left say they are concerned about global warming. São várias na costa do, do estado do Pará, de onde eu estou falando, também na costa do Amapá, né? uh, onde o, tanto os governos estaduais... O, quanto o governo federal é, tem interesse. Uh, há um problema ambiental. Provincial government and the national government. Are not concerned about environmental problems. Nesses recifes, mas é fácil, importante na biodiversidade, inclusive na reprodução de espécies de peixes que são comercializadas tanto por, por, por... So there's a crisis with the coral reefs and the reproduction of fish. And they want to exploit uh, offshore oil and is a big problem. Sorry, Mauricio, but the audio keeps cutting off. I can figure out how to do it. I can we give the floor to Joaquin meantime while we try to resolve your connection. Joaquin, ayúdame. Podemos ir con vos para ver si solucionamos el problema técnico con Mauricio. Perfecto. Mauricio, fíjate si podemos mejorarlo mientras escuchamos a Joaquín y te volvemos a conectar, ¿te parece? Hola Paraguay, Alternativa Socialista Paraguay está saludando. Bien. Eh, bueno, vamos con vos, Juaco. Bueno. Vamos con, bueno, con del movimiento anticapitalista. Hey, so Joaquín Araneda from Anticapitalist Movement of Chile. So while we wait for Comrade Mauricio. So in the first place, greet this. Second International Forum of e Socialist Ecological Politics. This event is an expression of our international to generate spaces of strengthening 
political organization with the objective of confronting or facing the challenges of our day in the deepening of capitalist crisis. This crisis represents the irrational profit gaining of a few uh, to the detriment of the majority and of the environment. My comrades will speak more about the COP. So I will discuss, I will speak more to the other part of this uh, panel. I'll talk about the progressives in Latin America. And I will touch on three things. One, the crisis of capitalism, the consensus, the commodities com consensus and the first wave of progressivism to the new progressivism, like the Chilean case, and three, a proposal of an alternative. We find ourselves in a time marked by war and crisis, which we don't uh, rule out the possibility of war, like Carl Sagan's video, Comrade Jesse were saying. And this leads to more repression and authoritarianism to face the economic crisis they have. So as a result, we are facing a, a higher political and social polarization that is shown with popular people's responses to the attacks of capitalism in intensifying its offensive against labor and nature. In the 90s, after the dictatorial periods in Latin America, which had the objective of physically eliminating the historic accumulation, political accumulation of the working class that had questioned the stability of capitalism. These politics included the elimination of uh, trade barriers, the privatization of state companies, the derealization of markets, uh, these series of policies in the 80s and 90s were known as the Washington Consensus and were imposed by organisms like the IMF and the World Bank. In the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s, there was a period of a rise in the class struggle against the neoliberal policies and led to a period of governments that called themselves progressives and led to a kind of progressive cycle that was marked by these center-left governments that nonetheless did not break with the logic and the limits of this system. Between 2003 and 2013, we witnessed the period of a super cycle of commodities characterized by high prices of commodities in international markets. So some examples of the Latin American governments that are part of this Commodities consensus include Chavez in Venezuela, Correa in Ecuador, Evo Morales in Bolivia, the first Lula government in Brazil, among others. They adopted politic policies around exploiting and exporting massively a natural resources, minerals, oil, gas, um, grains with the objective of generating a rent to through the sale of commodities in international markets. In 
and the fall of commodities uh, prices after 2008 marked the beginning of the end uh, of this cycle, led to a high economic volatility. As a over exploitation of natural resources and dependency on those commodities weakened the sovereignty of these countries and intensified the tendency towards extractivism and the rise of authoritarian uh, regimes includes even using the military Once more, we see the impossibility of reforming capitalism. Their comrades have given examples of this. The Brazilian comrades have shown the so first point. We on to the second one. After the failure of these progressive projects, we saw a return of right-wing governments in the continent. This, these governments rose to power, taking advantage of the opportunities open to them by the so-called progressive governments. But this was in the middle of an acute economic crisis. In 2018-2019, we saw a new, we witnessed a new cycle of the class struggle. In this context, we saw right-wing governments that were imp struck by this rise in struggle, like, and gave rise to new center-left governments like Boric in Chile, Petro in Colombia, Fernandez in Argentina, and the new Lula government in Brazil. Unlike the first wave of pro the progressive governments, this, these uh, electoral wins of these governments take place in a period of economic deterioration. And with further polarization and as a defensive vote against far right candidates like Cast in Chile or Bolsonaro in Brazil. In the case of Gabriel Boric, who came to power in an unprecedented moment in Chile after a rebellion, the crisis of the regime that put an end to the duo duopoly in the country and allowed for this victory of the conglomerate of the broad front in the Communist Party which has government in an intent to normalize the country and allow a cycle of a neoliberal accumulation. And open the door to applying all the policies that the right wing had been unable to implement in the previous period. So here all all refer to four examples of their policies and other similar ones that do a kind of greenwashing and play into the hands of the right. The first example is given by our comrade Camilo Parada, which is the exploitation of lithium by the Boric government. In the first place, the logic of reproducing the logic of a rent-based state, a subsidiary state, against a sustainable development. So the state intervention is leaving that extraction of minerals in the hands of transnational. Lithium in Latin America is concentrated in 
a triangle around Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. And it shows the inter-imperialist struggle over this area. Second place, Boric electorally had in the campaign had been against the free trade agreement of the Pacific. And once he reached power, he ratified it. It's a free trade agreement that includes Canada, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, Malaysia Peru, Mexico, and Chile, which brings together 13% of the world economy and aims to turn over sovereignty uh, to corporations. The free trade agreement creates a straitjacket for our democracy, says economist Juan Gabriel Palma. Among the consequences of the free trade agreement, there is one in, in an eventual legislative change that favors state the state over corporations corporations will be able to sue the state so there are laws that could be implemented but if they are implemented under the regency of the free trade agreement it could open the state to being sued. In second place, governments and transnational companies can intervene in public policy. Second, a uh, third, that all of this deepens the environmental catastrophe generated by extractivism, perpetuating the model of plunder and expoliation of our territories. The privatization of seeds can be added to this model. A third example of Boric's greenwashing is the new agreement with the European Union signed on the 8th of December of last year, which includes a adjustments in the system of resolution of conflicts and its mechanisms. The European Union has admitted that it is similar to the other free trade agreement. Since these bilateral agreements will also have organisms that will be above the government bodies and the sovereignty of the country. Fourth example is the confirmation of a repressive structure and maintaining the impunity of the repressive forces. There's a historic conflict over Mapuche territory in an attempt to take over those forests and uh, their resources. And the state has taken to classifying those communities as terrorists to attack them. And this is part of anticipating the conflicts that will rise in the rest of the country. Uh, 
And so the state persecutes Mapuches and these policies are go hand in hand with the impunity of the repressive forces that repressed the protest in 2019. During Boric's government, the um, period of exception, the longest period of exception in the Mapuche territories has taken place. We can add to this the uh, expansion of mining projects that ignore the uh, environmental evaluations of the of their their own bourgeois institutions because they express the dynamic of the global tendency of capitalist governments. And the third aspect of my exposition, I'll finish with this, is evident that in times of crisis, the priority of capitalism is to have a profit over prioritized over life or the health of the majority. And governments like Boric's accumulate a social base during elections, promoting, a proposing ecological or feminist governments and who become the best administrators of capitalism. This experience we are experiencing with Boric and others in Latin America I put up to debate. It's an expression of what we are going through. We have the challenge of building strong anti-capitalist alternatives to confront the submissive governments of Boric or Fernandez or the new Lula government. These governments many times make an effort to exaggerate the strength of the right to justify that they can't do more. The crisis will also generate a higher inter-imperialist conflict and the irrational nature of the system aims to limit labor rights and to attack nature. And so it goes against the two sources of wealth in society, nature and labor. So building opposing these initiatives and building a way forward, a route map for a, the 99% is what we propose ourselves. The building of a anti-capitalist eco-socialist project that can include as part of its strategy for dismantling the current government the uh, current situation. There are challenges that go beyond our borders. So understanding this collapse and building what we need, this forum is part of that project. So Thank you, comrades. And thanks, Joaquin. And now let's close, uh, cross our fingers and see if 
Mauricio has been able to resolve his audio problem. He's, he's joining now. We can wait for him a little bit. Like I said, uh, you can raise questions in the chat. Okay, problem. I left the computer and I'm using a cell phone now. So we characterize the government of Pará, where the COP30 will take place in Belén. This is a progressive government. The progressive government of Bala is approached progressive sectors and with the return of democracy this the aristocracy of Belen approached progressive sectors after the return of democracy this benefited them and helped them grow in the province of Pará. Since 2004-2005, the Workers' Party, the PT, Lula's party, began to ally with this party, the perspective of a popular front. And more recently, the majority of the majority leadership of PESOL is now relating to this aristocratic family and its government of Belen. The PT and the Communist Party of Brazil are allied to Lula's government and the provincial government. And what could be a strong opposition from PESOL, PESOL is beginning to embrace this government. To have an idea of how the COP will take place. Even the municipal government is not debating the COP in relation to the environmental problems and global warming, which are never resolved by the 
heights of these governments and the interests of the Belen government is about the investment that the COP will bring. So climate change is not being discussed here. The environmental crisis is not being discussed here. But rather the aspect that this event will bring profitable investments to the city. There's discussion over oil extraction in the Amazon River Delta and the and the ocean at Pará. And there is a struggle with the native people. Near the border of Brazil with French Guiana. It's a discourse that uh, progressives in Latin America have here that they talk about sustainability, but with their main projects go against the current of these interests. So there's intentions of exploiting offshore oil in this region. It's a fragile ecosystem, the coast of Pará and Amapá in the north. There are many wetlands, areas of uh, species reproduction that feeds the population and local commerce. And the oil could impact the population, the commerce, and the native peoples. A second characteristic of this false discourse is uh, deforestation. The provincial government and the national government support all the initiatives of big business. So the levels of deforestation here are the highest in the country. And the municipal government of Pesol in Belen City is contradictory. Because it has an, a gold a enterprise here in Berlin. So they have an oil uh, gold refining business. Two of these businesses are being investigated. One of them is from Canada, which has its production uh, paralyzed because of environmental problems. And so they are have no contradiction with illegally extracted gold coming into the city to be refined, and where there's even 
investigations taking place. So this gold has is stained with indigenous blood, agribusiness and oil business are some of the main problems in Brazil. The deforestation, agribusiness and oil are the are the main propulsors of global warming. And they are not being confronted by the local government. The planet won't come to an end. The most vulnerable population, the poorest, will be the most affected by climate change. A recent heat wave in Europe and North America. Provoked 18 deaths around the world. Deaths due to high temperatures have risen. Many people die every year from extreme heat events. In June, there was 43 degrees. The health ministry told of many times of heat, many cases of heat stroke. So, what's the most affected population? The poor, the working class, which have no possibility of protecting themselves. here as well this last week we had very high temperatures so we're seeing this process of rising temperatures here in the region as well have been some of the hottest day with medium average temperatures of 27 degrees. This had never uh, gone beyond 17 degrees. These are many different processes that cause more environmental destruction and more problems for the working class and for the most vulnerable sectors who have their homes with risk of flood, of collapse, houses that are built on the hills or the mountains. Those are the people that are affected by global change. So the left has to denounce this and organize an event against the COP, a counter summit of the COP. where the affected communities can propose their alternatives because they are not going to solve any of our problems. Wanted to highlight the hypocrisy of the imperialist countries when they say they're going to sit at, at these summits and solve these problems. 
in the last few years, many of their studies have come up that they had been hiding that show that they knew from years ago the consequences of their actions for the environment. And just in the last 10 years, we started to find these studies. The oldest study is from 1959, from many years ago, where there was already a discussion from a conference at Columbia University in New York, where they had developed the hydrogen bomb, and they were already warning about a climate change, global warming. In 1965, there's still time to save the, the humanity from global catastrophe. This was 60 years ago. United States already had the information to know that this process was going to advance. Project to expand oil. In a study at Stanford University, warned that fossil fuels continue to propel the global warming in the decade of 1960, the consequences will be catastrophic. Once again, the oil companies of the time hid these studies. When this debate was taken to the U.S. Congress in 1995, there was the first COP. That is, the international bourgeoisie already had evidence of the catastrophic consequences of this from the 1960s. So the hypocrisy of these governments is exposed. There should be no expectation placed on the COP. We have to organize the people, the working class, to confront on the left. To show that they're not debating our sovereignty. It's not sovereignty what is at stake, is the survival of humanity that's at stake. Many, spe many species will be extinct and the working class will be the most affected because the bourgeoisie will find a way to protect their interests. Even a part of energy consumption will be denied to the working class. The crisis in food production won't affect the bourgeoisie. We have to face this problem. Thank you. Excellent, Mauricio. Now that I see that you're connected in Silvia Leticia's Zoom account, want to greet her. 
She is a council member for Revolución Socialista and PESOL in Belém. Hello, Silvia. Are you feeling better? Because she is ill. That is why Mauricio spoke in her place. So we want to take up their proposal to organize a great counter summit in Belén to raise the voices of those who they have always put down and realize our counter summit. Okay, so we're going to read some of the questions in the chat and we'll answer some of them and if there are more, we'll see. There's one for Joaquin that we can respond together. We can't tell the... Yeah, we can't say Russia comes to extract the lithium in Bolivia because Russia doesn't disrespect Bolivia like others. Another question, lithium is essential for alternative uh, energy. So if it was in the hands of the working class, would it be correct? Third, uh, fracking and offshore oil production are proposed in Argentina as the alternatives to finance our economy. Uh, will the COP discuss this? Lastly, sweet water is uh, progress. Let's discuss what happened in Agua Escondida and Lago Escondido in the south of Argentina. La One more, Gonzalo from Venezuela, who wrote in the chat, from Venezuela, the authoritarian, bureaucratic, neo-bourgeois government of Maduro, which poses as progressive, leads a highly extractivist, predatory policies in Orinoco, where a humongous part of the country is turned over to the corporations that left that supports the government of Maduro legitimizes this ecocide. This has to be denounced. So it says the COP30 will take place will have the objective of justifying the extractivist policies of these governments. It's a shame that has to be denounced. And, uh, Question for the Brazilian comrade. We want to know about the oil companies in Pará and the iron mines. So, Joaquin, do you want to begin the response? Bueno, sobre la pregunta, o bueno... La anoté acá. Sí, sobre el litio y Bolivia, pero no solo Bolivia, porque... Eh, about lithium and Bolivia, not just Bolivia, but the triangle of lithium is also with Argentina and Chile. It is a region that is historically a mining region. 
solo eh, decirle, ¿no? Tenemos que llegar a un diálogo democrático entre las, los trabajadores, las comunidades, los territorios. We have to achieve a democratic debate of the working class, the native communities, and not allow the, these people that come to the territories to extract the resources, to plunder them. So we need that debate to discuss what we will do with this. So there is a capitalist mode of production aimed at producing speculative goods. And in, and in that profit maximizing model, there's a division of labor that places our countries as providers of these commodities. So if it's Russia, China, United States, Japan, whoever it is that operates under this same logic, it will take the same form. So the anti-imperialist sovereignty is not just against U.S. or British transnationals, but also with any other companies that come with the same aims. Entonces, eh, no, sin, sin equivoco, nosotros no tenemos so, que... Undeniably, we have to stand against any kind of imperialism and multinationals that come to exploit our, our lands. Russia is currently trying to submit an entire people in Ukraine, there is a war, which is obviously a military conflict, but is also economic. So in that sense, we can't say there is a good or progressive block. So we need a development that is horizontal across the people. We need a, an exchange based on solidarity of the peoples of the world without imposition. And taking the example of the comrade of the miners of uh, Bolivia, Argentina, or Chile, they should be at the center of a discussion of what kind of extraction, production, distribution, and consumption do we need for the mass of the population, not just for the elites. We have to take into account that for the extraction of lithium, water in great quantities is essential. So we need to discuss the resource of water as part of that. So it is a much deeper network that is under discussion. And the mode of production Also, if we have to stop them, kick them out, whether they be Russian or Chinese, we need the construction of the working class. That's why our project can never be far removed from workers who produce everything and make the world function. And finally, Jesse can tell us about the rebellion in Jujuy in Argentina.
because there is a, an offensive by the bourgeoisie there with the objective of facilitating the extraction of lithium there. In Chile, we see something similar. And the, with Salmonera in the south of Chile, and for example, there are sectors of the left, like PTR in Chile, eh, at that time would say Salmonera under workers' control. And we think it's, uh, it's a disaster of a company. It's a mode of production to produce Norwegian salmon in southern Chile that is destructive in every way. It's not a rational way of producing anything that we should think of recovering. So this concept is, is something we need to adopt. Let's pay attention to what's happening in Jujuy and in other places these days. Mauricio, would you like to continue? Hola, sí. Estoy pensando. Estaban preguntando sobre las petroleras de Pará y la exploración de hierro en la Sierra. Questions. about the exploitation of iron. We had a state company that was privatized in the 90s. And it became Vale, which became a multinational that exports minerals to Canada from Africa and many countries in Latin America. And what we see in Carajas is the old discourse that it's a process that would come to Amazonia to enrich in the population and generate development. All processes that we have been installed in Amazonia since the dictatorship. Even during the governments of Lula and Dilma, they have all functioned under the logic of imposition of companies coming from abroad under the same logic of colonialism to be in conflict with the local population. These businesses that come, they take the wealth and they leave holes in the ground. So with the privatization in Caracas, there was an intensification the point where the machines work 24 hours a day. The road that leads from there to the port was doubled in size and breadth. I think that in the next 30 years, there will be no more iron from the level of exploitation that has taken place since the privatization. And in this iron road, what we see is bags of minerals. The population to protest against Bali would block the road to protest. And in many places, the business built so, uh, 
barriers to keep the people from protesting. So the company says we have to protect the environment, but it is all a green facade. The exploitation of oil in the coast of Pará. There is gas exploitation in the interior of Amazonia and the part that has border with Pará, Petrobras. The oil companies say there was never any accident in Amazonia. One of the discussions around the uh, oil business is that Petrobras never had a big problem no but other companies did we have to see what happened in Peru in Ecuador where shell what they did there if it hasn't happened yet with Petrobras the Brazilian oil, state oil company that doesn't mean it won't happen the main problem today is related to It's not in the forest, but in the ocean. So in this equatorial region, from the border with French Guiana, to the northeast coast and the beaches of the southeast where there is oil exploitation and Petrobras wants to expand oil, oil extraction in this whole region. So we started to debate oil extraction in Amazonia. The investigations on climate impact in these regions were interrupted. A series of companies and Petrobras and even parts of the left that are in Lula's government who ally with capital to govern. A senator who left the PESOL a few years ago was one of the main organizers of stopping that suspension and the working class and the peoples of the region are organizing you know Amapá, there's already a process of organization that comes from before it had to do with this struggle of the native people of Mapa, which led to suspending the license for drilling. So the native communities of northern Mapa are still resisting the oil extraction and people in the coastal region are beginning to mobilize uh, 
And so all the peoples in this region are organizing to fight against the oil extraction. So we want to uh, join this discussion. Silvia Leticia's mandate is discussing in the city council to open a, a forum there to open the doors to organize the resistance to this. For now, the investigations are suspended. And the conscience of the people are being fought over. So the pressure of these businesses is very strong among the people. So if our work is not strong against this, it will be difficult to have a strong mobilization against this. So we are in a struggle for the conscience of the, of the masses to gain strength for the struggle against the oil companies that want to drill our coast. So French companies and other countries got the license to exploit this region. But the information we have is that because of the resistance of technicians and public servers, we can't have illusion in European governments that have not resolved any of this in their countries and the struggle against global warming. They don't want to actually they don't actually want to change the energy matrix. So they leave, but they don't question that other com companies like Petrobras do the same. And they end up financing the production of energy in the first world. Well, comrades from the Eco Socialist Network have a question from Catamarca. I think we are in a moment. with overwhelming scientific evidence and what we are already experiencing all around the world in relation to extreme climate events. We have some questions we should make ourselves. One of them, one of them, I have resolved, which is just because I am organized with other people, which has allowed me to not uh, throw, not give up. It's a, the collapse of capitalist civilization is inevitable. It's collapsing everywhere. If it is right that our that the working class and peoples of the world pay for the damage of their party, of what the handful of 
capitalists that have generated this. No, it's not right that we pay for that crisis. No, en los marcos de un estado nación. So these changes are necessary in the world economy, not in one nation state. Are these changes possible within the capitalist system? No, it's not possible. Another question is if it's worthwhile knowing that there is an irreversible crisis. Is it worthwhile to organize to try to save what we have left of our planet? Because those of us who are here, we can still open the tap and get water. In the panel with the Kenyan comrades spoke, there is already no more water. A sister people in Paraguay already lack water. These are problems that our comrades are already suffering. So if 2023, we don't understand that capitalism knows no borders, that there are no countries for them, that capital is transnational. So to think that Chinese capitalism is less bad than U.S. capitalism when they don't act according to nationality, they act according to a thirst for profits, Borders are there to divide people, but capitalists don't recognize any borders. To think in 2023 that Russia can bring some kind of benefit or progress to the Latin American working class, what we have to be asking is, what does Russia have to do here? What we have to be asking is, why are people are subjected to a primary economy. We have to not fall into the traps of Petro and Garcia Linera of Lula, of Boric, who say we need to maintain extractivism and extract the lithium the oil to as a first step to liberate our people. This lie they have been repeating it to us for so long and the only thing it has generated is higher levels of poverty of unemployment and misery far from generating in no country did this have a result it didn't happen in bolivia it didn't happen in argentina didn't happen in Brazil or Chile. Our economies are semi-colonial economies of banana republic bourgeoisie. Which go to these summits to give ecological speeches that are all lies because they return to our countries after speaking in our name and applying offshore oil drilling and tell us that if they are state-owned, they are safe, that lithium extraction will bring profits. And look what happens in the Mexican offshore oil drills that have explosion and workers' deaths. The deep water offshore drills. If someone thinks the deep water oil drilling will not sobre la base de mutar hacia otro proceso, a otro modelo. Claramente que tiene que ser de energías limpias, pero ojo con caer en la trampa. A transition to another system 
it has to be clean energy. But lithium is not a source of clean energy. It's a source of energy storage. It's the same thing they told us if, with agribusiness in the 90s, that with transgenic rice, with the green revolution, that one rice bean will have the same proteins as a beef, the, the golden rice. It's a lie. It will generate more desertification, more hunger. They told us the same about mega mining, that it would be the, the necessary process for the socialists that use cell phones. But it's everything that has already been extracted of these minerals and metals with a policy of recycling and reusage, we could live for many years with no need to continue drilling new mines. And lithium, it's the same story. And when we talk about lithium mega mining, we're talking about huge amounts of water. And whoever controls it, whether they be state-owned or private or mixed, does not resolve the problem of the energy transition. Because if they were actually concerned about this, they should be discussing this not only in the International Socialist League Forum, it should be discussed all around the world. It should be discussing this. If Russia was so concerned in the Bolivian workers, they should be investing less money in the bombs and, and war industry, the same with the NATO. So let's not believe these lies that there are powers that are better or worse when the only real division is the class division, not the division of any nationality. Because the only way to break from such a collapse is if we unite all the oppressed with the left, workers, peasants, women, the youth. This is a class issue. And that all of the capitalists, be they European, American, or African, these are all states controlled by the 1%. And none of them have given any sign of wanting to resolve any of our questions. All of them are interested in generating more and more levels of productivity. That's why it's crucial what these, what the comrades of Brazil say of organizing a great counter summit. Because that is where they will go to discuss that uh, offshore oil is for progress for the working class or that nationalized lithium can be the key to the progress. The movie that Leonardo DiCaprio did, Don't Look Up, is truer than many other things. To start fight for a, a grain reform around the whole world, and reach the solidarity and democracy ever, and the planification of economy around the world, but in the interests of the needs of the masses in producing enough food for everyone and distributing it logically. And so how do we discuss a agrarian reform so that no child goes hungry? It is criminal that 
in our countries where we produce an abundance of food, we have children who are starving to death. So the industrialization at the service of everyone being able to access housing instead of being all piled on top of each other in villas and favelas. So thinking in the nationalization of railroads and the merchant shipping lanes in industry to to bring real jobs, not in maintaining the primary economy of exporting raw materials for two bucks. We discuss what is the best solution for this, knowing that we don't have much time left. We discuss, are we going to continue defending states that are genocidal, ecocidal, or will we break from all that and organize workers and the youth to kick out that parasitical class? There's people that tell us that we are utopian. I think it is more utopian to think that in the middle of the First World War, the Bolsheviks could take power in a state. When workers were killing each other over imperialist capitalist states, that it was possible for the workers in Russia to take power. That was utopian. Imagine if in the 21st century, with struggles everywhere, the strikes in France and England, seeing Chile rebellions and Jujuy in rebellion. Don't tell us we're not in better conditions for workers and the people to confront everyone at the top. The progressives are the most negationists. Because they are the first ones to apply extractivist policies in every country. We need a radicalized program of confrontation with national states that don't defend the necessity of the majority, which are not neutral states. They're states of the of the ruling class and before it's too late we have to take our destiny into our own hands with a revolutionary program to change history that's what the eco-socialist network that's what the international socialist league is for fighting for all this and not falling for the lesser evils The only contradiction we need to resolve is the contradiction between exploiters and exploited, the oppressors and oppressed, to put an end to the oppression of people by other people. So these debates have to be permanent, and I celebrate that. From the ISL, we can open these debates And we'll continue them in the heat of the processes that will continue taking place all around the world. Thank you.